Step back for a moment to 1964 and 1965. The U.S. is poised to take its greatest leap forward for civil rights and social justice if a new and untested president can break the 100-year stranglehold by Southern segregationists on any anti-discrimination legislation advancing through the Congress. And that's a big if. The seniority system has kept congressional committees chaired by the longest serving representatives and senators and that means those paleo-Confederate Southern Democrats can still hold up the civil rights and voting rights bills that would end segregation and black voter suppression. The civil rights bill has been stalled since Harry Truman proposed it in the late 1940s. Lyndon Johnson, a man who famously gets what he wants, became president through a tragedy after two and a half years of President John F. Kennedy's tentativeness on the civil rights bill and voting rights. Tentativeness that emboldened and entrenched those Southern segregationists. Johnson will do anything to get a bill through Congress, a body which he long imposed his will on as Senate Majority Leader and a powerful House member. And he used his legislative savvy for an historic win in making the Civil Rights Bill law in 1964. Then, to keep the momentum against violent racism going, he proposes a sweeping voting rights bill to stop the murderous voter suppression of blacks in the Deep South. To get this voting rights bill passed, LBJ surprises everyone from Martin Luther King to George Wallace and all moderates in between. The longtime centrist, anything but militant Southern President Lyndon Johnson used the passionate core slogan of the civil rights movement in his speech to a joint session of Congress. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves full blessings of American life. Their cause must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. It was a profound moment. YouTuber Rashid Kapadia called the speech a sermon and a sledgehammer, with the moment LBJ broke protocol by saying, we shall overcome being the sledgehammer that carried the day among the politicians, the commentators, and much of the public. Now compare this to 2009. Republican Representative Joe Wilson of South Carolina also broke protocol, but in a tawdry way that defiled the social contract of our democracy that says you respect the institution of the presidency, even if you disagree with the president. There are also those who claim that our reform efforts would ensure illegal immigrants. This too is false. The reforms, the reforms I'm proposing would not apply to those who are here illegally. Though Wilson caught some flack for the outburst, overall it was considered just part of the game where all's fair. No one in the Democrat-controlled House even considered bringing a vote to reprimand Wilson for heckling the president. Not a reprimand because he criticized the president, but because he lowered the level of discourse by behaving like a rude teenager in a school assembly. And yet, the rule in the House chamber is that visitors who heckle someone at the podium, the president or anybody, are expelled from the House. Notice here that Obama, Vice President Biden, and Speaker Pelosi, just after Wilson shouted, you lie, are taken aback by the unprecedented tactic by the opposition. Compared to 1965, 
when it was the entrenched segregationists who are the ones taken aback and totally flattened by the surprise statement coming from the podium. So what turned the Democratic Party's liberal or non-Southern wing from a group that successfully raises the nation's aesthetics with the we shall overcome moral sledgehammer into the timid party that feels it has no choice but to accommodate childish heckling that appeals to the lowest in the nation's people. Before America could be turned from a society where respect for its institution of the presidency demands civility during speeches to a nation where immature heckling during the tradition of a presidential address carries the day, several damaging changes had to be made. Tabloid TV and infotainment replaced any semblance of journalism. The fairness doctrine and limits on the number of broadcast outlets any corporation could own had to be ended. And the court doctrine of money is speech had to be created. But before any of those changes happened, two Democratic Party supporters wrote a book imploring the party to reorder its priorities. The book was fair critique, but it also marked the beginning of the Democratic Party's retreat into being the Please Don't Hurt Me Party. It was called The Real Majority, written in January 1970 by Ben Wattenberg, a former speechwriter for Hubert Humphrey and a member of Lyndon Johnson's White House staff. And Richard Scammon, a data researcher who formerly served as director of the U.S. Census Bureau. In this 1970 book, Wattenberg and Scammon warned the Democratic Party that its recent efforts to form a coalition of the left and center, composed of youth, the poor, blacks, intellectuals, and the socially alienated, would be disastrous. In persuading the Democrats to surge away from the left, the real majority hammered home that the party must gear itself national elections to capture the, quote, unyoung, unpoor, and unblack. Most Democrats in and out of office scorned the book, saying not only that Wattenberg and Scammon were rudely throwing blacks and the poor under the bus for political advantage, but also that the real majority's advice made technique more important than policy. And if you wonder why in this era, the Republicans can completely fail to balance the budget or give us peace through strength, yet they can walk away from those policy failures without being held accountable simply by squawking culture war fear-mongering, it's precisely because technique has become more important than policy. During the 1970 midterm election season, Democrat leaders largely held firm against the call of the real majority. But two years later, the candidacy of Senator George McGovern going down in flames at the 1972 general election after McGovern had failed to get white working class voters to join a coalition of youth, feminists, environmentalists, the poor and blacks, made Wattenberg and Scammon feel vindicated. The book the real majority asserted that the typical American voter in 1970 was, quote, the 47-year-old wife of a machinist living in suburban Dayton, Ohio, unquote. And according to the authors, this hypothetical voter was worried about riots, crime, campus unrest, and moral permissiveness more than racism, poverty, or the draft. If the book The Real Majority accomplished its goal of pushing the Democrats toward the center, let's visit how that family of a then 47-year-old machinist in suburban Dayton, Ohio, is doing today as a consequence of the party of working people moving away from the left, as Wattenberg and Scammon's book urged. The machinist union scale jobs and pensions have disappeared due to corporate merger mania and free trade treaties launched by Reaganomics. The free hand given Purdue Pharma 
and other corporations may have that machinist couple's grown children addicted to opiates, and the grandchildren the couple are raising in the absence of the incarcerated parents are facing health problems because of high fructose corn syrup and high carbs in their foods. All of these difficulties that have destroyed that predictable, stable existence back in 1970 resulted from the Democratic Party refraining from being the party of economic equity, instead being the party where Bill Clinton conspicuously golfed with corporate CEOs while never meeting with Ralph Nader, and where he strategically criticized poor black people. In the real majority, Wattenberg and Scammon launched the process of shaming the liberal wing of the party for its closeness to blacks, such as when the party had Los Angeles attorney and activist Yvonne Burke chair several sessions of the 1972 Democratic Convention on television before the nation. The book also told the Democrats to pander to the myth that they were soft on crime, Never mind that under Nixon and Nelson Rockefeller's war on crime, 70% of those imprisoned were nonviolent offenders. Don't point this out, roll with the public's fear-driven misconception was the real majority's essential message. Today, the 47-year-old spouse of a machinist or the machinist himself, instead of being unyoung, unpoor, and unblack, is unpro-life, unrich, and unQAnon. They are more concerned with fighting COVID than fighting mask requirements. The moral permissiveness they have been harmed by is practiced by the pharmaceutical industry, Wall Street criminality, and corporate farming methods. The great impediment to uniting the suburban Dayton families with others who are victims of these unleashed forces of corporate greed or the nation's racial divisions, those same divisions that in the real majority, Scammon and Wattenberg implored the Democrats to pander to. The book urges Democrats not to automatically reject the slogan, law and order, as racist. And yet, two years after George Wallace had been turned into a paraplegic by bullets, he admitted that law and order and other similar phrases he had used were racist. Instead of joining in on the dog whistle racism machine, the Democrats who had ushered in civil rights laws could in the 1970s have begun a process of explaining to the machinists of Dayton, Ohio and similar places that racism had turned black communities into places of joblessness, toxic chemical dumping and food deserts and that unless you join with black people and fight these common enemies by, say, 2024, suburban Dayton will be beset with those same crises. And in the actual 2024, those right-wingers who are telling you immigration by non-whites is weakening your country's bloodline are really using that hateful rhetoric so they can soon come after you. The Republicans' end game is to gut your Medicare, health insurance, social security, and livable wages, not to protect you from a supposed attack on your bloodline. But instead of leveling with white, centrist, blue-collar voters, the party strategists in the decade of the 70s begin heeding Wattenberg and Scammon's ill-advised lectures to accommodate themselves to the various unexamined prejudices of the center. As for the Joe Wilson incident, it's not just a matter of why didn't the Democrat House leadership even consider a resolution to reprimand him for behavior that would have gotten anyone in the House Visitor Gallery expelled from the chamber. But Democratic Party leaders didn't seem to realize they could use this same sort of method to cut the strength of birtherism and other disinformation campaigns. Mitch McConnell, quietly, without fanfare, had acknowledged that Obama, in fact, was born in the United States and that the birth certificate rumors were wrong. But by not being asked to sign his name to that belief on a resolution, 
he and the Republican Party were enabled to passively, aggressively pander to those undiscerning Americans who were swayed by the birtherism lie. Officially, but quietly not siding with birtherism while on the lower level, allowing it to work for their agenda. Mitch McConnell and John Boehner could have been forced to make the difficult choice of voting yes on a resolution condemning disinformation. Or if they chose to vote no, the Republicans would own the effects of that organized disinformation right up through QAnon and January 6, 2021. Once it became clear the Democrats would not use their powers to drive a strategic wedge between Republican leaders and the rogues running the rumor mill, the far right was freed up and energized. Immediately, mobs of angry, often out of control, misinformed zealots began jamming local town meetings in which Democrat representatives came back to their districts to discuss the Affordable Care Act. That ACA, also called Obamacare, successfully reduced the number of Americans without health insurance to a 40-year low, while reducing the rate of health care cost increases to their lowest ever, including in communities like Aiken and Lexington, South Carolina, in Joe Wilson's 2nd District. Yet Barack Obama got less political mileage out of these successes of his ACA than Joe Wilson got by shouting out, you lie, during a presidential address. Indeed, technique had become more important than policy.